Hi everyone, uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Olga Redding and I am the Education Outreach Coordinator for Iowa Organic Association, kind of in charge of all the educational activities that happen within our organization. And thank you everyone that is joining us online. Um, uh, you're part of the RMA Roadshow workshop, so I'll go ahead and get started with my presentation. So Iowa Organic Association is a small nonprofit that was established in Iowa in 2006, and we are committed to organic education, advocacy, and building a community uh, of organic farmers that can support one another. Our mission, of course, is to advance organic agriculture and food systems in our state, and our members repre represent a diverse community of organic farmers, food and farm businesses, and anyone and everyone that wants to champion and support the movement. And you guys are part of that community, so thank you for, for being here. As far as our organization priorities, we have all four overarching priorities, education, outreach, advocacy, and building a community. So I'll kind of go through those a little bit just to give you a little more understanding on each. As far as education is concerned, we provide programs and expertise and information to help diversify these opportunities in our state. And some of the things that we have been in charge of is working with NRCS and training the NRCS staff and district conservationists on what organic practices entail. Our first training happened last December, December 15th, and we had 30 district conservationists that showed up to that training, and we will continue to do so for the next four years. So each year we kind of have an overarching topic that we train them on, and each year it, it, it's different. In addition, we have received a grant funding from a Resource Enhancement Conservation Education Program for two years, where we've been going to 17 colleges across the state of Iowa and teaching uh, environmental science and agriculture type students on what organic farming is. Um, so during those lectures, I usually present a little a presentation on kind of the history and the movement and what the National Organic Program entails. So that's the first part of the presentation. And the second part involves including an organic farmer in that region that shares his or her experiences of why they pursued organic and, you know, the challenges as well as the benefits of organic production systems. So with that, we actually have received tremendous uh, success with the students because there um, a lot of them more than 70 percent of them don't know anything about they responded having zero to little knowledge about some of these topics and what's been really wonderful to see is that here this last semester in the fall, I just tabulated the evaluations. 93% of the students gained additional knowledge from our lectures, and 94 rated our lectures that either good or excellent, which is outstanding. So we know that what we're doing with that really is uh, important and just giving them this information that they don't otherwise wouldn't get is, is important to push the movement forward. Um, we also do a lot of outreach events where we set up booths at various conferences across the state. Uh, Jeff was talking about Practical Farmers of Iowa Conference here earlier. We were there this weekend. We're also planning on being at Marble Seed, which is formerly known as Moses Conference, and then Oil Grain. And we're always involved in various trade shows and community events to kind of spread awareness. As far as additional resources, our website, of course, is a huge resource, iowaorganic.org. Um, on our website, we always update the calendar uh, page with various events that are happening with our organization and, and other organizations in the realm. And then uh, obviously we have social media pages, all of that good stuff that you can follow us. Our YouTube channel, I would say, is a very helpful resource um, to anyone that is interested in movement. We have um, recordings from conversations with Farm Service Agency on map we have recordings on crop insurance and we have just a, a variety of organic farmers that we showcase with those webinars so definitely recommend checking that out as far as ad advocacy 
we always try to stay in front of our policy leaders. So in 2021, we met with Secretary Nag, and then uh, just the recent development that you know we uh, got involved with is this top funding. So um, the administration stated that they're looking to move $300 million into providing additional education about organic and encouraging organic production. And iOrganic Association is one of the leading partners in this uh, funding in the Midwest region. So there's multiple organizations involved across the state and we're uh, across the country and we're one of them in the Midwest region. Um, and then, of course, building a community. Becoming an organic farmer is not an easy feat. So, you know, relying on each other for support and recommendations and resources, that's what we're here for. So, you know, feel free to always reach out to myself or uh, our general inbox, info.iorganic.org, with questions. While we may not have all the answers right away, we will always find them or help assist you with those questions. Uh, an additional really helpful resource that we have uh, that we create and update on a yearly basis is our organic resource directory. I would uh, suggest grabbing one of those before you leave. Um, it is also available on our website in PDF form. Um, so this directory has over 900 businesses, nonprofits, educators, and service providers that basically can assist you through this transition journey. And we believe that it serves as a valuable tool for your continued success um, in achieving growth as an organic farmer. And so today, uh, just a quick overview of what you will learn. Um, we'll, we'll, uh, uh, Griffin and Michael will share additional details about the whole farm revenue program, which uh, is a, a policy that ensures those operations that have revenues up to $17 million in yearly, on a yearly basis, and then micro farm program with, rev, with for smaller producers that have revenues with up to $350,000. And then finally, the transitional organic grower assistance program, which is uh, meant for agricultural producers who have crop insurance coverage on crops in transition to organic or certified organic. So uh, uh, for, in your case, that would be a great program to check out. And then, of course, we as a small nonprofit rely heavily on membership and support that way. If you're not already a member, definitely consider becoming one. Uh, you know, you can connect with Roz or myself, but all of that information is available online to uh, personal memberships, $50 a year, business is 100. But anyways, that's just something for you to consider if you'd like to do so. But um, that's all I have you today so thank you so much for listening to my spiel and thank you everybody online and i'll go ahead and uh give the floor to griffin with a risk management agency so thank you uh, bear with me for a moment while i bring up uh the correct presentation All right, looks like we're good. Um, my name is Griffin Schnitzler. I am part of the uh, Whole Farm team at the Risk Management Agency. Um, I'm here to give you some more information on the WFRP uh, or Whole Farm Revenue Protection Program um, and the associated microfarm program. Uh, first, a little bit about me. I have been working um, at the uh, RMA uh, for about 10 years. Um, and I have been part of the whole farm team uh, basically since the program was released back in 2015. Uh, so I have a long history um, with this program and have been here through the uh, development cycle. Um, I was also part of the team that developed and released the microfarm program. 
Uh, I want to start with kind of a brief overview of both WFRP and Microfarm. Um, as I said, WFRP was first offered back in 2015, and it's intended to be a crop insurance policy that ensures all of the crops on the producer's operation under a single policy. Um, Microfarm uh, was first offered in 2022, so this is the second year of the Microfarm program, and it's intended to be a much more streamlined and simplified version of WFRP um, targeted primarily towards smaller producers. A few just key uh, bits about WFRP and Microfarm. Um, WFRP covers up to $17 million in insured revenue. Um, Post-production costs and value added are not included uh, as part of the insurable revenue. Um, expected values, uh, that is the prices of commodities, are based primarily on third-party sources. Um, and then the, the expected yields for each commodity are based on the producer's own history um, to the extent possible. Uh, one additional factor for WFRP uh, is that you can purchase individual um, crop insurance alongside it. That is, you could purchase, um, say, a corn policy in addition to WFRP. Um, uh, these policies are considered primary insurance, and there is a premium rebate associated with that. Uh, under Microfarm, um, as I said, it is intended to be streamlined, so there's a significantly less paperwork. Um, it ensures operations uh, with an approved revenue of uh, up to $350,000 for the first year uh, or $400,000 for carryover insureds. Um, one of the key differences is that post-production uh, costs and value added are insurable in the microfarm program. Um, and then the expected values are based on the insured's past three-year average uh, of revenue and acres, uh, rather than having individual prices and yields uh, by commodity. One limitation of Microfarm is that you cannot purchase uh, individual crop insurance policies along with Microfarm. Um, we have gotten comments on that, and that is a factor that we're um, going to look at, whether or not that will be the case uh, in future years. Before I go further, I do want to uh, focus a little bit more uh, on the microfarm policy, um, partially because it's new, but also because I think it has a lot of potential uh, to reach producers that um, the WFRP program itself hasn't really been able to reach. Uh, and that is uh, due to several factors, but there's a couple of key um, paperwork reductions uh, that I want to highlight that I think are most beneficial to smaller producers. Um, first of all, uh, post-production and value-added costs can be included uh, in the insured revenue. Um, for example, if you are producing strawberries uh, and you are processing that into jam, under WFRP, it's the value of the strawberries uh, that's insurable. You have to back out um, of all the additional value added by uh, making jam. Um, under Microfarm, that is not the case. You can insure the value of the commodity after post-production, so you're actually insuring the value of the jam. This is kind of a dual benefit. Um, first of all, you don't have to submit the paperwork to back out to the original value of the commodity, um, so it's a simplification there. Um, but it also allows uh, those smaller uh, operations that do receive a lot of their revenue from post-production um, and value added uh, it allows them to insure more of their farm's um, actual expected revenue uh, because they can insure that post-production uh, and value added. Um, a second key factor uh, for Microfarm is that it does not break out um, expected value uh, and expected yield by commodity. Um, so all of the commodities are reported basically under under a single line item uh, and the farm operations um, approved revenue is determined using that rather than each commodity having a separate price and a separate yield. Um, the intention here is, is looking at, say, a small operation with 40-some uh, commodities on a half acre, uh, and they're bringing it to a local farmer's market. Under WFRP, um, they'd be required to or they could be required to provide um, a separate price and a separate yield for each of those 40 commodities. 
it's simply not feasible uh, for a smaller operation. So that's the kind of situation that Microfarm is intending to address there, really to simplify um, those record keeping requirements and, and bundle all of those commodities together into a single insurance guarantee. Um, which kind of brings me to the uh, first and possibly most important question of, well, what do WFRP and Microfarm actually cover? Um, both WFRP and Microfarm cover revenue from pretty much all agricultural commodities produced on a farm operation. Um, this can include hemp. Uh, this can include things like animals and animal products. Uh, it can include commodities that are purchased for resale. Um, other things that I've been asked, it, it can cover apiculture, um, so honey products, uh, it can cover aquaculture. Um, really, th the only limitation there is that it can't cover uh, timber, forest, uh, forest products, or animals for sport show or pets. Um, an additional thing that WFRP itself covers is that it can offer replant payments. Um, so if a commodity is wiped out early in the year, uh, there is a replant payment um, that can help get that commodity back in the ground. Uh, because of the way Microfarm bundles all the commodities together, uh, replant payments aren't available under Microfarm. Which, okay, so the question after, well, what does it cover um, is, well, how much does it cover? Uh, and both WFRP and Microfarm um, ensure the lower of uh, the current year's expected revenue, and that's reported on a farm operation report. And I'll give a little bit of more information on that later. Um, or the adjusted, adjusted historic revenue of that farm operation. Um, so the lower of what you're planning on doing or what you have done in the past, although there are adjustments and allowances um, for uh, some historical revenue, which I will also cover a bit later. Um, again, I want to highlight uh, post-production and value added because that does go into how the approved revenue is determined. Um, for WFRP, all that value has to be backed out except for what we call market readiness operations. Um, and market readiness operations really are just things that are basically done in the field or immediately adjacent to the field. Um, once a commodity is removed from the field, brought to another location for packing or washing or, or processing, um, that's when the uh, that's when the market readiness operations end, uh, and those costs are no longer included in approved revenue. Um, for microfarm, of course, uh, post production value added is included as insurable. Uh, so that does factor into the approved revenue uh, for the insurance uh, guarantee. The guarantee itself is based on uh, the approved revenue multiplied by the coverage level. Um, the coverage levels are fairly flexible. They go from 50% up to 85% uh, in 5% increments, which really allows a producer to pick uh, the dollar amount of coverage that works the best for them. Um, for WFRP, uh, to get the highest two coverage levels, that is the 80 and 85% level, you are required to have at least three commodities uh, on your farm operation. Uh, Microfarm doesn't have that limit. Microfarm automatically qualifies for all coverage levels. Um, for those of you who may be familiar with our other programs, uh, WFRP does not have a catastrophic coverage level. Um, so there is not the like, set, uh, I think it's a $600 fee uh, these days to get the very lowest um, form of coverage. So once you have the amount of insurance, uh, question is, well, what causes the loss payment? Um, and it's pretty much anything that can come under the broad category of natural causes. Uh, so too much rain, not enough rain, uh, too much wind, uh, too many bugs, not enough bugs uh, for um, those uh, commodities that are highly dependent on pollinators, um, disease, hurricane, really anything that you can attribute to natural causes. In addition, uh, both WFRP and, and Microfarm cover price loss. Uh, so if you have a commodity that's you know, worth a certain amount at the beginning of the year, has a price collapse, um, that price collapse is in an insured uh, cause of loss, and so you can get compensation uh, for a commodity um, when it's had a price collapse. Um, 
before uh, before a producer can get an indemnity, they do have to file taxes uh, for the insured um, year. Um, and then as long whenever the revenue to count, that is the amount they have sold. Um, excuse me. The amount of commodities they they have sold plus the amount that's in inventory uh, at the end of the year, whenever that's below uh, the insurance guarantee, um, an indemnity is due basically dollar for dollar uh, uh, the amount below the insurance guarantee. One of the key uh, factors um, for WFRP is diversification. Um, diversification has a lot of impacts on the program. Um, first of which, as I said, is the coverage levels available um, under WFRP. To qualify for the highest coverage levels, you do need at least three commodities. Um, and then there are some additional diversification requirements uh, under WFRP. Uh, if you have potato potatoes, um, you have to have at least two commodities. This is uh, an issue, uh, a legal issue where RMA is not allowed to offer revenue coverage for potatoes. Um, so you can't get revenue coverage for just potatoes uh, through WFRP. Um, in addition, uh, commodities that have other, uh, if you only have one commodity on your farm um, and that commodity has other revenue coverage available uh, through federal crop insurance, um, you're not eligible for WFRP. Um, really, that's because if you have a customized uh, tailored policy for a specific crop, that's just going to be the better option. Um, so we don't want uh, people using WFRP when there is a, a better program available to them. Um, diversification also determines um, some issues when it comes to premium. Um, first, there is a diversification discount. That is, the more commodities you have on your farm operation, the lower your premium rate will be. Uh, and, and this recognizes that when you have multiple commodities on your farm, um, you're less likely to have a total wipeout because if one commodity does poorly, um, it, it's possible or, or even likely that another commodity can make up some of that difference. Um, Microfarm is just a set diversification discount. Um, rather than counting up commodities, uh, Microfarm basically assumes that you have three. Uh, in addition, um, the subsidy uh, that you receive is based on the uh, number of commodities on your farm operation. And subsidy is basically the portion of your premium uh, that the federal government kicks in. Um, and I do have a chart there to show you how significant that premium subsidy can be. Uh, the basic subsidy, so somebody who has one commodity, um, you're looking uh, at that top line where you're starting at a 67% subsidy, which is pretty healthy. Um, but once you get up to 75%, uh, the subsidy rate is lower. It's still 55%, which is still definitely significant. Um, but when you start getting multiple commodities, that's when what we call the whole farm subsidy rate kicks in. Uh, and, and the whole farm subsidy rate uh, is as high as 80%, uh, although at the 80 and 85% coverage level, uh, it does drop off. Um, one of the frequent questions I get is like, well, what does that actually mean as far as cost? Uh, and recently I was presenting in Connecticut. I ran some numbers there. Um, under Microfarm, uh, the producer premium per $100 of coverage is around $2. Um, so $2 per $100 of coverage. If you're a beginning farmer and rancher, it's even lower than that. Um, so the coverage can be very reasonable. Uh, when, when you're looking at the whole farm subsidy. Um, and that's at the 75% coverage level, I, I should have specified. Um, WFRP um, has a few other limits, um, and this comes down to the limit on insured revenue of 17 million, uh, but that is uh, insured revenue, not the historical revenue uh, of the farm. Um, so a significantly larger farm operation can be covered under WFRP uh, if they select a lower coverage level. Uh, in addition, there are some other limits under WFRP. Um, coverage is limited to $2 million in expected revenue from animals and animal products. 
um, and, or, and $2 million in expected revenue from greenhouse um, and nursery products. Uh, both of these exclude aquaculture. Aquaculture is not subject to those limits, so an aquaculture operation um, can get up to the full 17 million. Um, and this doesn't uh, it, this doesn't include um, commodities that are grown in a hoop house necessarily. Uh, an example I would give is if you're producing tomatoes in a hoop house and you're selling the tomatoes, you aren't subject to the nursery limits. If you're producing tomato plants and then you're selling those tomato plants, that's when the nursery limit kicks in. Okay. So that was kind of a lot, and that's kind of a 30,000 foot overview uh, of WFRP and Microfarm. Um, and I do have some more specific information that I want to get into, but I want to like pause here for a moment, um, take a breath, do a brief recap. Um, if there are any questions uh, from you folks here in person, uh, now is a good time. Um, unfor unfortunately, folks online, we do have a Q&A feature, but while I am presenting, I can't see it. Uh, so I'll look at questions uh, for uh, online folks at the end of the presentation. Um. Your three commodities uh, in commercial crops be uh, included in any policies or are they already have to uh, So the question was for the three commodity limit, can commercial crops uh, be included? Yes, um, commercial crops can be included. It's it, it goes by, are, are they different crops? So corn and soybeans are different crops. They count as different com crops for commodity uh, purposes. Doesn't matter if they're conventional, organic, wh whatever market channel they're sold through, um, they'll still be considered separate commodities. Um, corn, commercial beans, and organic corn, say, wouldn't count as three commodities. No, uh, be, because it is based on the physical commodity that's being produced, regardless uh, of whether it's organic or conventional. So, um, so if you're producing conventional corn and organic corn, uh, that's one commodity because it's corn. Um, and really, it's just like corn will have, whether it's organic um, or conventional, it'll have a similar risk profile as far as weather and other um, potential impacts. So it's just, the diversification impact uh, of, of different practice um, doesn't make a huge difference. Uh, uh, okay, so just to recap, uh, WFRP can cover up to $17 million of insured revenue. Um, Post-production and value added are not insurable under WFRP. Uh, the expected values are based on third party sources. Expected yields are based on the producer's own yield records. Um, and WFRP can be purchased alongside other federal crop insurance policies. Uh, WFRP also has uh, replant payments available. Microfarm has significantly less paperwork uh, than WFRP. Uh, it can insure farm operations with approved revenue up to $350,000 or $400,000 for carryover insureds. Um, Post-production and value added costs are factored into the insurable revenue. Um, and Microfarm is automatically eligible for the 80 and 85% coverage level. Uh, expected values are not based on individual commodity calculations. It's based on the producer's total revenue uh, from their farm operation um, in each of the three previous years. Uh, and then one current limitation of microfarm is that no other federal crop insurance can be purchased alongside a microfarm policy. So the next thing um, I want to talk about are uh, some things that can impact a producer's history. Uh, as I said, it isn't just the simple history uh, or the simple average of the producer's previous three years or five years um, that determine the amount of approved revenue. Um, there are some things that can adjust that. For farms that are growing, uh, there are two things that can increase the historical average. One is an automatic indexing calculation. Um, so if a farm is growing year over year, uh, that indexing calculation will automatically raise their approved revenue above their simple average. 
Um, the other has to do with expanding operations. Uh, if a operation is, say, purchasing more land uh, or uh, installing irrigation facilities, um, switching from uh, conventional orchards to high density orchards, uh, transitioning to organic practice. All of these are eligible for an expanding operation uh, up to 35%. Um, and it's something that you work with your agent and your AIP uh, to determine the approved amount. The key here is that it does have to be a long term uh, change to the land. Uh, so adding more land would qualify uh, transitioning from conventional practice to organic practice would qualify because again, organic practice is a long term change um, to the land. Uh, something that wouldn't qualify is choosing to plant potatoes this year um, rather than corn. Uh, so um, farm management choices on commodity mixes are not uh, eligible for expanding operations. In addition to raising uh, above the historical average, we do have some mechanisms that will prevent a producer's approved uh, historical revenue from dropping uh, too much. Um, and we have three mechanisms here. One is revenue substitution. Uh, so if the uh, revenue from your farm operation is below 60% of your simple average in any given year, uh, you can choose to insert 60% there uh, for the purposes of calculating your approved revenue. Uh, we also allow revenue exclusion, uh, which is if a producer feels that there is a specific year in their history that is not representative of their farm's um, potential uh, revenue, they can choose to exclude that year when determining their approved revenue. Uh, and then finally, we do have a 90% cup on approved revenue, meaning that the approved revenue cannot fall more than 10% from what it was the previous year. Um, so you can't have it like a really precipitous drop off uh in your approved revenue or and your insurance amount um based on the change in your history and uh to go along with the history i want to talk about the records that are required uh for establishing a, a producer's history um, for wfrp it is based on five years of farm tax forms uh primarily the schedule f although there are ways to submit a substitute Schedule F. Um, but uh, a key thing to note there is that WFRP does have a lag year, um, which means that it is uh, not the five years immediately prior. Uh, there, it's five years plus one. Um, so for example, for the 2023 crop year, it would require tax forms um, from 2017 to 21 uh, to 2021 for calendar and or early fiscal year filers, or 2016 to 2020 for late fiscal year filers. Now, there are exceptions under WFRP. Um, veteran uh, farmers and ranchers or beginning farmers and ranchers are eligible uh, with fewer years uh, of records, um, so they can come in earlier uh, than those six years would otherwise require. Um, and in addition, uh, Persons who would otherwise qualify that are not required to file a federal that are not required to file federal taxes. Um, a prime example here would be tribal entities. Uh, they are allowed to file a substitute Schedule F. Uh, and, and then we do have a one further allowance, which is if a producer was physically unable to farm uh, for one year in their history, um, they can take a zero in that year uh, and still be eligible for WFRP. This is particularly notable these days uh, because, um, you know, if if a producer was unable to farm during COVID uh, for a year, um, then they would still be eligible for WFRP. Microfarm is a bit different. Um, Microfarm is based on the last three years and it has no lag year. Um, so for 2023, it would require tax forms from 2020 to 2022. Um, for calendar and early fiscal year filers, or 2019 to 2021 for late fiscal year filers. On the other side uh, of how approved revenue is determined um, is the farm plan for the coming year. 
Um, so I talked about history, but there's also information required from the producer on what they're planning on doing for this coming year. Um, under WFRP, that's where it gets to. You have to have uh, an expected value, so you have to have a price source um, for each commodity. You have to have uh, a yield history for each commodity. Um, on, under microfarm, it, it it's just the total revenue and acreage for the past three years. Um, there's also uh, there may also be other supporting records required. Um, you know, uh, an organic certification, for example, for organic acres, um, or uh, inventory reporting if, if a producer is carrying over some inventory from the previous year. Um, one thing to note uh, is, is that expense reporting is no longer required. Um, and if you're not familiar with WFRP already, this probably isn't going to be very meaningful. Uh, but if you are familiar with WFRP, it is a significant reduction in paperwork because you no longer have to file a parallel expense report for each year in your history. Um, you are still required to file a full Schedule F, so you can't redact um, the expenses portion of the Schedule F but you don't have to do a separate reporting process for it. Uh, and then just as a reminder, um, the approved revenue, that is the amount uh, of revenue your farm is expected to produce is the lower of um, that historical revenue uh, from the previous slide um, or your expected revenue uh, for the coming year um, that you'll do uh, at the sales closing date. Uh, and that brings me to kind of the timeline um, for WFRP and microfarm. Sales can begin as early as September 1, um, and that's because the contract change date is August 30. Uh, in general, I would only expect to see September 1 sales for uh, late fiscal year filers, uh, and that has to go with the sales closing date. Um, for late fiscal year filers, the sales closing date in all counties across the country is November 20. Uh, for uh, early fiscal year filers and calendar year filers, it, it it's dependent on where you are in the country. It, it matches up with the most common um, sales closing date for other federal policies in that county. If you're really far south, uh, it can be as early as January 31. Um, if you're a bit more north than really far south, uh, it can be February 28th. But Throughout most of the country, the sales closing date uh, is March 15th. And this is when a producer will file what's called their intended farm operation report, and that is what they are planning on doing uh, for the coming year. This is actually a, a really key factor because the intended farm operation report is where the producer gets their revenue protection from. Um, so at the beginning of the year, you say, I'm producing these commodities, and I am expecting to receive these prices for these commodities. Uh, and that way, if later in the year there is a price collapse for a commodity, you're still insured at that original price, that price that you reported on the intended farm operation report at the beginning of the year. Uh, so that's how uh, WFRP uh, provides revenue protection. Um, Microfarm is a bit different, uh, but it does Ha it does require an intended farm operation report. It just doesn't require separate prices and yields for each commodity. Later on in the year, um, so uh, at July 15th for all insureds, uh, a producer will file what we call a revised farm operation report. And that really reports what they've actually had, what they've actually put in the ground uh, on their farm operation or, or the animals that they actually have. Um, so the intended farm operation report is this is what I plan to have. Revised farm operation report is this is what I actually have. Uh, and then the revised farm operation report is the basis of the insurance guarantee uh, and also the basis of the amount that the producer will be charged premium. Um, speaking of which, the billing date uh, is August 15th for all insureds. The premium isn't due uh, for a few months after that, uh, but it's calculated and billed as of August 15th. Later on in the year uh, is the final farm operation report. Uh, and that is, uh, I think of it as, this is what I did do um, during the previous year. Uh, and it really just reports um, the revenue produced, uh, the commodities produced, that kind of information. It's due either at the time of loss um, or by the next year's uh, sales closing date. If 
And if a final farm operation report isn't filed, uh, the producer's coverage level is limited to 65% uh, for the coming year. Um, so again, the farm operation report is a three-part report. The intended is, this is what I plan to do. Revised, this is what I am doing. Uh, and then final farm operation report is, this is what I did do. Um, some other facts to understand about WFRP and microfarm, uh, and this is a question that we get pretty frequently is, well, what timeline um, uh, does WFRP cover? And, and it's really whatever is produced uh, during the insured tax year. Um, and by produced, we mean mature and ready to sell, regardless of whether or not it is sold. Uh, so a commodity that is grown last year um, and held over an inventory is not insured um, and is also not counted against the producer when, when it comes time to calculate uh, a loss during the, pre during the current year. Um, but similarly, if a producer is producing something during the current year and holding it over an inventory, um, that is included as the revenue they produce during the insurance period. Um, for commodities that grow each year, um, only the amount of insurance, only the growth in value uh, during the insurance period is insurable. An example here would be calves. Um, if they're worth $800 at the beginning of the year uh, and they're expected to be sold for $2,000 at some point during the year, um, then the amount insurable is that $1,200 in expected growth. Uh, and again, this is all kept track through the inventory and accounts receivables forms. Um, and those are filed annually, both for WFRP and microfarm. We also frequently, <coughs> excuse me, we also frequently get questions on how the prices and the yields are determined. Um, this is mostly applicable only to WFRP, uh, but um, the price or, or expected value has to be what the producer can reasonably expect to receive on their farm operation um, for the marketing channel in which the commodity will be sold. And it's based to the extent possible on third party sources. Um, there are some circumstances where a producer's own records can be used, uh, but those are fairly rare. Um, the only other time when a third party source wouldn't be used is if there's a marketing contract. If there is a marketing contract, the price on that contract is the price of the commodity. No questions asked. Thanks. We also get questions on the yields um, that are used uh, to calculate WFRP. Uh, and the yields, again, must be what the producer can reasonably expect to produce on their farm operation um, using the land and the physical capital that they'll be using for that for the coming year. <clears throat> In general, it's based on the producer's own yield history. Um, so if a, if a crop is also covered under a separate uh, federal crop insurance policy, it's just going to use the same yield as that federal crop insurance policy. Um, for commodities that aren't insured, uh, it's based on a four-year history. Um, there is a separate form that is filed. It's very similar uh, to how yield is reported under our other crop insurance programs. Um, there is an exception uh, for the price and yield reporting um, under WFRP for direct marketed commodities. Um, direct marketed commodities can be reported very similar to how um, microfarm is reported. So it's all bundled together uh, under a single commodity code, and it's just the total value of direct marketed commodities uh, and the total acreage of direct marketed commodities planted. Um, something to note, though, is even under W, even under the direct marketing um, provisions under WFRP, post-production value added does still need to be removed. Um, that is only included. That is only includable uh, under the microfarm program. Both WFRP and microfarm um, are available through crop insurance agents. Uh, RMA does have a crop insurance agent um, locator tool available through our website. In addition, um, if you have any questions, you can feel free to contact uh, Lane Webb, who is the WFRP team lead, um, or myself, or the entire WFRP team. Um, those are our emails. 
contact us with any questions you may have. Um, that's the end of my presentation. I'm going to check. Are there uh, questions in the Q&A? Seven questions in the Q&A. OK. I'm just going to read these uh, so that the folks uh, in the room also uh, can hear them. Um, so the first question is, we recently converted our operations into an LLC and we now have two owners where previously there was only one owner bringing a son into the operation. How would this impact the tax requirements for the tax forms? So it follows along with those tax forms. Um, and this is a situation where it would follow what we call the 90% rule. And what that means that if there is a successor entity um, that is either purchasing or inheriting or somehow acquiring at least 90% of a previous entity's farm operation, they're el eligible to use that entity's tax records. Uh, so in a situation where you're forming an LLC, that LLC will be using the same land, the same physical capital, it's just bringing in an additional owner. Um, it would be eligible for that 90% rule and it could use the tax records of the previous entity. Um, and that question was specifically related to Microfarm. Uh, the answer is the same for Microfarm. Um, hold on. Uh, do WFRP and Microfarm cover agritourism? Um, or what about something like a UPIC orchard? So WFRP and Microfarm um, can cover agritourism in the sense that it can capture the additional value for agricultural commodities um, from selling them through something like a UPIC operation. Uh, so if you if you are selling commodities at a significantly higher price, um, you aren't locked into uh, a price source that isn't reflecting your marketing chain. Uh, an example I would use here is say blueberries. Uh, RMA does have a blueberry policy, and it may say that blueberries are worth 35 cents a pound. Um, if you're running a UPIC blueberry operation and you're selling those blueberries at $5 a pound, WFRP and Microfarm can both capture that additional value. Um, what it can't cover is it can't cover things like sales for hay bale rides, um, sales of things like bottled water. Um, so the, the way it can ensure agritourism is by capturing that additional value of those commodities um, sold on the farm through either UPIC or, or an on-farm stand, that kind of thing. Uh, it can only cover revenue from the action from the agricultural commodities themselves. Another question: Can Microfarm cover a small organic apple producer that uses all their app apples for hard cider and apple brandy without growing other crops? Yes, um, Microfarm would be uh, would be able to cover uh, a, a a producer that's using all of their crop um, to create post production uh, commodities. In this case, um, looks like hard ciders and, and apple brandy. It would only count as one commodity uh, because we are going back and we're looking at the original agricultural commodity here um, when we're doing uh, diversification. This isn't applicable to microfarm. This is applicable to whole farm. Um, so whole farm would also be able to ensure a producer that is processing their own crop um, into cider or brandy but you'd have to back out all of the value added that you get uh, from, uh, from taking it from an apple uh, to a hard cider or, or a brandy. Um, and, and in that case, it would count as one commodity. How does one reach someone from the RMA in their state uh, to discuss their situation? Um, I think Michael's gonna go over some information on how to contact the regional offices. Um, and that's going to be the best way to reach out to RMA is through the regional office for your area. Uh, they'll have the best knowledge uh, of your local conditions. Um, additionally, I would strongly encourage you if you have questions to reach out to an agent. Um, crop insurance agents will be able to answer a lot of questions and there are questions that are kind of based on how the company is going to underwrite something. Uh, and those kinds of questions um, are best handled through an agent anyway. 
uh, but Michael will have some information on the regional offices. OK, I think that is all the online questions I have. Um, do we have any other in person questions? OK, well, thank you all for your time. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Michael to uh, discover uh, to sorry, discuss organic crops and some other regional issues. Okay. We will be taking a 10 minute break and starting again at 2 p.m.
Okay. Um, my name is Michael Green, and I'm a specialist with the St. Paul Regional Ar Office of RMA. And we just got a lot of really good information um, from Griffin on whole farm and micro farm. I'm hoping to kind of give you a little bit more of a beginning to end um, information about crop insurance. Maybe you haven't had crop insurance before. Um, maybe you're new to that and you want to know more and you want to know some key key phrases and, and information because it's a lot it's a lot to understand and I'm, I'm hoping to be able to get you to a place where you feel more comfortable and you're able to have those conversations with agents that you need to have to obtain crop insurance on the agenda today crop insurance overview um, some tools that you can use with your agent to customize that crop insurance and then some program updates and changes that might be relevant I'm out of the St. Paul Regional Office. That's we're based in St. Paul, Minnesota, but we're all working remotely. So we actually have staff um, throughout the three state region of Iowa, Minnesota and Wisconsin. Um, our director is Pamela Stocky, and I noticed I know that somebody had asked earlier, how do you reach out to us? This is exactly the way um, you can shoot an email to rsomn at usda.gov or you can give us a call at 651-290-3304. Um, but ultimately, I will remind you that we, the federal, uh, federal government doesn't sell the policies. You'll have to work with an agent to do that. Um, so we can help you if you have any questions um, or you're having difficulties um, with an agent, but feel free to, to reach out to them as well. Um, one disclaimer that I'm going to give you at the beginning is that any information that I say doesn't change or supersede any policy, procedure, or actuarial documents. So I'm human. I might make a mistake. Uh, hopefully I won't, but I'm going to try to give you the best information possible today. Um, there are actually 10 regional offices. You know, the St. Paul Regional Office is Minnesota, Iowa, Wisconsin, but there are 10. Um, and we, our role is sort of the liaison, the, the people that work with the public, the growers. We work with grower groups. We work with um, insurance agents. We work with um, approved insurance providers, the companies that provide the insurance, to make sure that all of the crop programs are working effectively and they're actuarially sound, so that we're you know protecting taxpayer money. Um, a big role of what we do in the regional office is to um, expand programs, find counties where a program currently isn't available, but there's a lot of growers that are, have, are interested in, in utilizing the program. Um, we analyze different rates and actuarial numbers to make sure the programs are working well. Um, a big thing that we do is write written agreements, and I'll go into those in a little bit, but basically they're exceptions that allow you to, to break some of the normal rules that we would normally uh, follow. And, uh, you know, just generally, we want to be in touch with uh, producers to make sure, again, that everything is working um, in their best interest. So the federal crop insurance system is comprised of growers. They're at uh, the bottom there in this picture. Um, there's a lot of people, a lot of different growers growing different things. Um, they buy crop insurance policies uh, through an agent, and that agent is then working with a, a private company called an approved insurance provider currently in 2014 for sorry 2022 there were 14 of them um, and then those companies have a standard reinsurance agreement with the usda and basically what that does is it binds them to a set of rules and regulations that we set forth for the different programs so that they're running things fairly and in a um with rules that are uh, meant to make sure everyone's following um, good practices for their farming and um, that we're enc encouraging just the best practices um, and that the rates uh, are also subsidized. So um, the federal government provides a subsidy like that Griffin was mentioning that earlier, um, depending on the coverage level that you choose and, and the different um, crop insurance program that you're doing, um, you might get a different subsidy and that impacts what your underlying premium that you're paying for that insurance. Um, the other people that I, I didn't fail to mention were that loss adjusters. So if, um, if you ever were to have a loss on your farm um, and say, say hail came through, an adjuster would come out to your farm from a company and look at your crop and figure out, uh, come up with a reasonable measurement of what your losses were so that you could be paid an indemnity. 
So the way the crop insurance cycle works is that there is an application process. So you would go to an agent. They would you know, run through some different options, um, hopefully about what um, insurance uh, crop programs might work with, with you. Maybe you have corn and soybeans and uh, a corn uh, plan and a soybean plan would just be perfect for you. Maybe you're uh, you grow June berries and kiwi berries and a whole farm or micro farm would be a really good fit for you because you can't get insurance otherwise. So um, they would be able to work with you to find the best fit for what you're looking for, what kind of coverage you would like. Um, you would apply for that coverage and then if it's all accepted and everything goes through, that insurance would eventually attach and you would be covered during the, the uh, period of that insurance policy being attached to your, your crop. Um, next in the season is acreage reporting. So you would report to your company exactly what you're what you've planted. Um, you'd get a summary of the coverage that you've you've purchased, and then premium billing. They'd say this is how much you owe us for that coverage. <laughs> not the not so fun part. <laughs> um, the next part would be if you do have a loss, um, you would indicate work with your agent to submit a notice of damage or loss of production, um, and then that would trigger again. Uh, the loss adjuster coming out to your property usually and um, coming up with the numbers of what you need to be paid out for for your indemnity um, based on your coverage and um, the losses that you had. Finally, the last part is program changes. Um, behind the scenes, typically RMA is making adjustments to your program. So we're maybe we're changing a planting date. Maybe we're um, removing some a rule, maybe we're changing prices. All of that happens in between the end of your insurance and the beginning of the next year's insurance. So um, we are always trying to make improvements to make sure that the policies are are working for growers. Um, look at this. Okay, so when you have that initial conversation with a crop insurance agent, one of the, the key phrases that you'll come across is plans of insurance. There are different plans of insurance. Um, often they're abbreviated, so don't get uh, scared by the, <laughs> the alphabet soup of, of it all. Um, a, a catastrophic coverage is that, you know, that lowest percentage of APH yield that can be covered, and it's really the cheapest kind of coverage that you can get, but it's only in the cases of, you know, uh, that worst, you know, you only want it if, if as a policy to protect you from a complete loss and, and you're not really worried about it. You don't think it's going to happen, uh, but it's just that that cheapest policy that you could get. Um, yield protection is a protection against loss of production. So if you're, you know, it kind of is self-explanatory. If your yields are less than expected, you uh, and your coverage level um, covers that, you are going to get a payout. Um, through an indemnity. Um, a revenue protection is a uses prices as well um, to feature into what your calculated indemnity might look like, and I'll get into that in a second. And then two other ones um, that I won't go into, but there are several other uh, plans of insurance. So just be aware that there's quite a few out there and that um, you should be exploring those with your agent. Um, don't forget to ask questions and um, make sure that you understand what you're what you're choosing. Um, so here's a little bit of an example um, of a producer with 65 bushels uh, APH yield and 75% coverage level. So for that yield protection example, um, we're taking their their yield from their their APH, their approved um, production history, and then we take that coverage level. So in this case, it's 75%. So we are guaranteeing that they will get 48.75 bushels. Um, but if they are, if they actually produce 30, there's that 18 uh, bushel difference, 18.75 uh, bushel difference on a per acre basis. And so then we would multiply that by the projected price and we would get a $67.50 indemnity per acre on that policy. Um, the revenue protection is pretty much the same thing, but um, there are two prices that get involved, the projected price and the harvest price. Um, the, whichever one is higher is the one that gets used. So um, what you'll see here is in different years, um, one or the other might be higher. So um, a revenue protection plan can often be a little bit more expensive because you're you're uh, more likely, you're, you know, the amount that you could get paid out is 
could be higher. So um, you're kind of paying for what you get. If if you um, you can kind of sit down and look at your history, look at your crop, figure out what's your history on your own um, on your own acreage. Have you seen a lot of losses? What do those losses look like? Um, what kind of coverage do I need? Are the prices kind of variable? Um, do I need to build that into my coverage? So kind of ask those questions as you're thinking about the insurance coverage that really fits you. Um, what is that market that you're operating in? And what do those prices look like? And what can the insurance do to help you protect you against the, the real losses that you're likely to see? So one thing that I mentioned earlier um, is an actual production history database. So basically this is a, a log of all the, the yields, actual yields that you've had. Um, there's a, a minimum number of years that you need to have insurance typically. Um, and so we can populate that with T yields. T yields are um, basically fillers. They can fill the gap and they're lower, often lower than what farmers would, would normally get, but they let you complete a, an APH database so that you can get insurance. Um, and often in some cases they can be replaced lower yields. So um, it's important to remember that your uh, APH history is a real key facet of what your insurance is going to look like because it's your history. Those are the those are the that's where your guarantee for your coverage is going to come from. Your guarantee that you're going to get a certain yield because um, that's your history. That's what um, we're expecting. That's what we're going to base it off of. Um, and so um, it's the basis for establishing premium and liability. Let's say if you have a lot of liability is the value of the crop. Um, and it's the higher the liability, the more you're going to be paying in premium, right? Because you are um, you're paying to make sure that if you any of that is lost, that you can get paid back, right? So a bigger number requires a little bit bigger payment on your end to cover those losses should they occur. Um, it represents each APH database um, represents the acreage planted to the legal location, practice, or in some cases type, and the production produced from those acres for each crop. So, for example, if you are if you grow apples and you grow them in blocks and you don't have a um, FSA farm number to associate with it, um, you might have a block number um, and a unit, and then you would just it would all that production within that unit would be in that database. So you might have a whole number of databases depending on the structure uh, and organization of your farm, but uh, an agent would help you figure that out. So another word that I use, units. <laughs> um, so the basic idea of a unit is the acreage of the insured crop in the county that is taken into consideration when determining the guaranteed premium and the amount of indemnity loss payment for that acreage. So there are uh, here's four different types um, that um, exist. Um, I won't go into the details. Take some time and to learn about them and to ask your um, insurance agent which ones might be best to break your um, production into. But um, it's a key um, a key term when you're deciding your crop insurance. So just remember that. Um, crop insurance includes a premium and a deductible. So a premium subsidy on an average, on average 62% of total premium. So uh, a $20 premium per acre, the farmer would pay for that 62% subsidy, uh, the farmer would pay $7.20 and then USDA pays $12.40. So um, one of the reasons that USDA is even involved in crop insurance is that it can, it's almost entirely un, uh, it's almost entirely impossible for an in, a crop insurance in, industry to exist without federal money in the mix because losses are so likely, right? Weather is unpredictable. Um, and so through these payments, it, it makes these subsidies, it makes um, insurance much more affordable for growers. Um, so it's important to know that the reason you're paying the price you are is that um, the federal government is subsidizing your policy. 
Um, so producers, producers do select their deductible. For example, a producer that selects a 70% coverage level, then the producer must suffer at least 30% loss before a crop insurance will pay an indemnity. So that coverage level, so let's say um, I have a, a field of corn and uh, actually let's go up to this example again. So in this example, um, this person has a 75% coverage level. So what does that mean? That means we guarantee 75% of that yield. So it's almost like, a, you know, with your health insurance, you'd have a deductible where you have to pay up to a certain amount. You're going to, no matter, you can never get a 100% payout for your loss. If you were to get zero um, production on the, on this acreage, you'd never get 100% of the value of the crop paid back. You would get up to 75% so that there's a 25% deductible in there um, that you, it's just hard to see it that way. <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, just to wrap this section up a little bit, um, there's a lot of terminology, there's a lot of jargon, there's a lot of things to learn when you're talking about crop insurance. So take time, talk to an agent and figure out, um, learn the language, figure out what it all means and make sure that you're getting the type of coverage that matches your operation and the, um, the you know the the type of um, losses that you're likely to to see on your operation um, for you know for some people um, again going back to like blueberries on a you pick operation um, you're really your best bet in order to get those or you know organic um, direct marketing prices whole farm and micro farm. OK, so some tools for customizing your crop insurance. So when you do have that conversation with an agent, um, these options can help. Um, help you um, your APAC database um, as time goes on. So yield adjustment is one um, producers may elect to substitute 60% of the applicable T yield for actual yields when their actual yields are less than 60% of the T yield. So um, with that option, so you have to elect, you have to say, I want this option. Um, it's not available for every crop program, but if it is, you would have to say, I want to purchase this. And then if you have a really bad year where your your yield is really low and it would reduce your average yield in that APH database that your guarantee is built on. So if you have a real, like a real low year, that whole average yield is going to come down, your guarantee is going to decrease. And so if you can replace those really bad years with um, with a, a, a substitute, um, then it will prevent you from having that th those real strong changes in your APH database and your and as a result, your guarantee. Um, similarly, uh, yield exclusion when there's really, really bad years, um, we can uh, throw out those yields. And um, that can help your APH database and your guarantee. Um, there's also trend ad adjustment. Um, that's sort of similar to in Whole Farm, how the um, operation revenue can be trended upward to track the growth of your operation. Um, that also is available for other um, programs. Um, two other ones are supplemental coverage option and the enhanced coverage option. Um, they are a little bit more complicated, but I would recommend that if you're starting those conversations as a new insured that you talk to um, your agent about it and figure out if it's something that fits your operation. Um, another thing that is available to crop insurance uh, to help you with your crop insurance is let's say you are a grower and you don't have a program available in your county. So let's say I grow apples in a county in Iowa where the program is not available. Um, you can work with your insurance agent. They will send a, a some some paperwork to the um, regional office. So me in St. Paul, I'll get some paperwork from your agent, and um, they'll essentially be asking, "Hey, can we uh, ha insure these apples in this county?" And I'll review all of the information they provide, and uh, depending on um, all the information, I can decide, "Yes, that's that'll be a good fit. We can use this." nearby county as a reference county and, and allow you to grow 
apples and have it insured in that county. So um, even if it isn't available, there are options. Um, there are a whole number of written agreement types. Um, I can I'll go into those a little bit, but uh, so some common ones are if if there's a crop not available in the county, but available elsewhere in the country, just like I, I spoke of. Um, another one would be a TP type. So let's say orga an organic practice isn't available in your county or um, some other type of practice uh, or uh, isn't available. We can pull that in from a different country, county and be able to use it in the one that you're in. Um, a common one in, in Iowa here is that there are a lot of flood areas and those areas because there's that additional chance of loss due to inundations and floods the the cost of those policies have a are an increased rate the amount that you pay for premium is higher um, due to those uh, that cause of loss so if you can prove to us through um, insurance experience of not having losses on that ground we can reduce that rate to potentially as low as the standard rate that you would receive elsewhere in the county um, we have maps that designate um, where those high risk areas are um, and again, you can work with your agent to figure out if you're in one of those areas and if you might qualify for a reduction. Um, your agent or yourself can look in our written agreement handbook to learn all about those types of, of written agreements and what might fit what you're um, you're up against. So in working with Iowa Organic today, I wanted to give you a little bit of a um, layout about where we see organic policies in insurance in the, in the country. Um, Minnesota, Iowa, and Wisconsin, um, the St. Paul region that I work in, is pretty well blanketed with organic uh, growers, and it's growing every day. Um, but it's still a, a relatively small number of the total um, number of insureds. So some options for organic producers. And this might also apply to more conventional growers, but in particular, it's important for organic producers because they can receive such a premium price for many of their um, their crops that let's say you have a contract um, to deliver apples, barley, something like that. That premium price is probably higher than um, what is in our documents, what we say up the price is. And so if you can, if you have a contract, you can elect that option and it will allow you to use that price that's listed in the contract as your price rather than one that we set. Uh, similarly, there, uh, there are contract pricing available for different types of uh, practices and types as well. Um, there is also an organic premium price selection, so a price that's even above what is in your contract. Um, but again, all of these options, as you tack them on, you're increasing the liability and the, the amount of um, uh, value that you say your crop is, and so it costs a little bit extra. But depending on what your crop is, especially if it's high value, you might want that coverage because if you do receive a loss, you're losing out on a lot of income. So uh, another thing that I wanted to point out today is that um, there is a transitional and organic grower assistance program. Um, this is a new um, initiative that's part of the USDA organic transition initiative. Um, it rolled out earlier this year, uh, or I guess late last year, and uh, provides uh, producers support through crop insurance premium assistance. So again, this is um, an additional subsidy on policies um, for all crops in transition to organic, a $5 per acre premium benefit for certified organic grain and feed crops, and a 10% point premium subsidy for all whole farm revenue policies covering crops in transition to organic or certified organic. Producers who have an additional um, individual crop insurance policies will also receive the applicable premium assistance on those policies. So another great thing about this is that it's automatic. If you are just going out and purchasing a policy, it will automatically show up on your bill and be you'll, you'll pay less. Um, so it's just something that the is a priority for this administration and um, hopefully it will support um, people as they're working to transition to organic. Um, sometimes in the regional office, we get a little, little bit surprised when um, agents or other um, stakeholders haven't heard about the beginning, the veteran and beginning farmer and rancher benefits. So um, 
These benefits include an exemption from paying the administration fees, administrative fee, which is the uh, baked into policies, and an additional 10% uh, points of premium says subsidy, um, use of the production history of farming operations where those people where the beginning farm or the veteran farmer has previously worked, and an increase in the substituted yield for yield adjustment. So these are, uh, if, you, if you're not familiar with insurance, these are really great benefits to have. So um, if you're eligible, make sure that you do talk to, tell your agent when you're having that conversation, hey, I am a beginning farmer or I'm a veteran farmer. And there are very defini various definitions that you'll have to fit for, for eligibility, um, but have those conversations if you think you might fit. Um, so for veterans, you must not have actively operated and managed a farm or ranch anywhere for more than five years or you must have uh, first obtained veteran status in the past five years. So um, similarly, I think the um, beginning farmer is someone who is not actively operated and managed um, for five years. And then if you're electing a whole farm policy, you actually have 10 years of eligibility. So um, that's a, a great benefit. So let's go into some new program changes that are coming into the mix this year. Um, so we have a double crop initiative. Um, the goal set forth by this initiative is to increase food production by increasing the number of county, counties where soybeans are planted for harvest following another crop in the same crop year as an insurable practice. So the overall goal is to make it easier for producers to ensure true crops on the same acreage in the same crop year. So normally that hasn't always been allowed. Um, so we've done that through some program expansions and easing history requirements for written agreements. So again, what is double cropping? Uh, double cropping is producing two or more crops for harvest on the same acreage in the same crop year. Um, for the St. Paul region, the only people that are impacted by changes are Southern Iowa, that's orange area. Um, they, we have waived the written agreement history, um, the, the history requirement um, for having grown it and uh, employed the double cropping practice. Um, and so you can apply for a written agreement and you don't need to provide that information. Um, as it's as the season is much shorter in Wisconsin and Minnesota and Northern Iowa, it's not really a best practice, and so we don't promote it. Um, so we do, if you do want to engage in double cropping, you can still apply for a written agreement. However, um, you must still provide the three years of production history to be insurable. So you're saying the orange no longer needs the agreement anymore. You do need the written agreement, so you have to apply for that, but you don't need production history. You don't need to prove that you've done it before successfully. Um, so for double cropping producers that do not meet the, the double cropping provisions will have their payment reduced per the first and second crop provisions. Written agreements do not change any double cropping or prevent plant policy requirements, and the first and second crop provisions apply if you do not have a history of double cropping. Okay, so another um, practice that is being encouraged by, encouraged by this initiative is relay cropping. So relay cropping is a cropping practice where a second planted crop is planted into a, an established crop other than a cover crop, where the crops are planted in a manner that allows separate agronomic maintenance and harvest of the crop unless otherwise defined in the crop provision. So uh, damage to either crop during planting, harvest, or general maintenance of either crop will be considered an uninsurable cause of loss. So um if the, in this ex, in this picture here we have wheat and then um soybeans it looks like are planted between the rows um so the they'll come in they'll uh, take off the the wheat from that crop and then the soybeans will come in and they'll har harvest those as a second crop um in this in this map uh, this shows that the zone one that blue area um has no records required but you still must submit for a written agreement um and then the that uh yellow ish color is zone three 
and that there is still a three year record requirement for that area if you're looking to do relay cropping. And be insured. So for the 2023 crop year, relay, relay cropping will continue to be insurable through type and practice written agreements. Um, there is a deadline of uh, the sales closing date for renewals and the acreage reporting date for new requests. And there are various um, FAQs and MGRs that are published that insurance agents should be aware of. Um, so this is maybe a little bit uh, more in depth, but these are the things that an insurance agent would need to provide um, as part of the written agreement. So, and there are a lot of resources that your agent can use, um, but also um, one of those resources is the regional office. Um, so feel free to, to reach out as, as needed. Um, one thing that we're engaging in this year is the it's a new program. We are doing a prog program performance assessment. So what that means is that the regional office is focusing on a set of crops that are in a cycle. Um, in this part of the cycle this year, we're focusing on a, a subset of crops to do a really in-depth review, contact a lot of grower groups, contact a lot of growers, and figure out if there's anything that needs to change in the program. Um, so nationally, we're looking at livestock policies. We're looking at different climate smart programs. Um, this look, this includes early plant dates for soybeans, um, that whole laundry list of things in there. Um, we're looking at hybrid seed policies and we're looking at nursery catalogs and, and checklists. In, in specific, the St. Paul Regional Office will be focusing on grass seed, oats, triticale, flax, cherries, cranberries, and dry beans. So next year we'll have a whole different set of crops um, and this will continue Every year we'll have a new set and we'll just try to focus on uh, those crops. So if you have any specific feedback and you utilize these programs, please do reach out and we'd love to hear from you if you have any thoughts. Um, some uh, recent important change for livestock is that uh, for the livestock risk protection, we've increased head limits. Um, that's a big change for the program. We've also um, reduced the time that insurance companies have to pay indemnities from 60 days to 30 days. Um, and then we allow unborn swine coverage for operations with multiple entity structures. And we've modified the endorsement length for swine to a minimum of 30 weeks for unborn swine and a maximum of 30 weeks for all other swine. Um, for livestock gross margin, we've modified the premium offset language to allow an un and ensured the choice to receive indemnities without a reduction to offset premium on any endorsements that have not ended. And for dairy revenue protection, we've allowed sales to be suspended during the sales period for situations that arise during the sales period in which marking conditions adversely change after the fact. We've also added flexibility to continue coverage when producers experience a disasters at their dairy operation. Um, a recent climate initi initiative includes the post application coverage endorsement. Um, this provides additional coverage in the event producers are prevented from post or split applying nitrogen due to wet weather and field conditions. Um, so the on this map here uh, with green was current, the blue is where it was expanded into. Um, and yeah, so that's all I have on that. And I know that was a lot of information. I hope you have some questions, um, but this is a picture of our website, um, the RMA website, some key places to look. Um, policy and procedure has uh, information on every um, crop program. There are tools uh, and then up here on the top right, there is a find an agent. So if you don't have an agent, this is uh, a tool that you can use to locate um, an agent, and you can even um, figure out which approved insurance providers are operating in your area and uh, contact them directly if you would like to as well. Um, our, our website is uh, rma.usda.gov. Um, you can also directly contact the St. Paul Regional Office through that phone number or that email address, and we would be happy to answer any questions or work with you if you are struggling in any way. So <laughs> hopefully if you have any feedback, you can contact us and, and let us know. Any questions online?
Don't you? Oh, I think I closed it. Can you put the transition slide up? Okay, Q and A. Uh, we started farming organically last year, soybeans. Should we even consider insurance? You know, Mike, that is a tough question. Um, I would, I would consider it. Um, at least have a conversation with an agent. Maybe you, if this is, I'm assuming you have production history prior to transitioning to organic, um, and so you can at least have that conversation with your agent to figure out what do you need to be eligible for insurance on your organic um, practices. Um, so yeah, I would have that conversation. It's never too early to, to start planning and figuring out what coverage is going to fit you and what you need to, um, to get it. Did you have a question? Uh, that one of the post negative things that we're saying again, or? Sure, yeah. I've been asked to show the face map again. Oh, no. And I can do it, I promise. Just believe in me. Okay, there you go. Is that shared online? Oh, okay. Did you have any? The green box is where they already had that. Yep, that's where it was original and it's expanded into the blue area. Uh, how much does that add on an average? Uh... I couldn't tell you. <laughs> Have to talk to an agent. Yep. I think it would. It's. Um, any other questions in the room? One more. Okay. Let's... For whole farm revenue protection, you need tax returns. Yes, you need your Schedule F um, or other suitable um, replacements for that, for that other suitable farm tax documents that would be able to substitute that. Um, Griffin, or do you have a better answer than that? So the question was, for whole farm revenue protection, do you need tax returns? And so the answer is yes, you need your Schedule F or a, any suitable replacement farm tax form. Is that the language? Schedule F or um, you can develop a substitute Schedule F. Uh, you don't have a Schedule F or the Schedule F doesn't contain all of the necessary information. Um, but you do absolutely need tax records um, but if you don't have a schedule F specifically, you can develop an alternative. Okay, yeah, so there are, there are options if you don't specifically have a schedule F, but it is really probably the most straightforward, easiest way to, um, to get there. So, uh, any other questions online? No? Well, I would just like to tell everyone thank you for being here. Um, I really appreciate these people, everyone in person and everyone online for joining us and learning more um, about crop insurance. Um, it can be a really kind of daunting uh, thing to move through. It's a whole different language. It's There's so many moving parts, but um, hopefully we've kind of clarified a little bit. You've gotten you started towards the right direction and you're able to continue those conversations with an agent or us in the future to to um, find coverage that works for you. So thank you for being today here today and have a, a great afternoon.